Hi, welcome to the EEV blog, an electronics engineering video blog of interest to anyone involved in electronics design. I'm your host, Dave Jones. Hi, it's May 1st, 2010. Well, okay, so what I hear you say? Well, it's a big deal. Why? Because it's the 10th anniversary of GPS as we know it today, the global positioning system. And it's also almost, as of May 3rd, the anniversary of geocaching, the ultimate high-tech sport for nerds. So I couldn't let the occasion go without mentioning it. Yeah, I know what you're going to say. GPS has been around a lot longer than 10 years, and it has. But on, uh, but before May 1st, 2000, uh, the system had, the GPS system had what's called selective availability switched on permanently. And what that meant is if you had one of these little GPS receivers, okay, then it was only accurate to a couple of hundred meters because when selective availability is turned on, SA is turned on, um, then civilians, plebs like us with these GPS receivers, there's a, there's a deliberate random error introduced into the GPS signal for us plebs. And unless you've got the, uh, which causes the error. And unless you've got the, uh, you know, the military decoding, uh, you know, codes, the keys to actually decrypt selective availability, that's all you got, a couple hundred meters, which wasn't much good for, you know, it was good for maybe uh, pilots and ships and people crossing the Simpson Desert or something like that, but it wasn't any good for your average, you know, your, your average person. Um, a couple hundred meters, but on May 1st, 2000, Bill Clinton, good on your Bill, said, I'm going to turn off selective availability permanently. Well, they haven't switched it back on, so it's pretty much permanent. Um, and that meant overnight, if you own one of these, it went from being a couple of hundred meters accurate to, you know, 10 meters accurate, 20 meters accurate. Uh, it was fantastic. So literally overnight, with SA turned off, that started the boom in these GPS receivers. And that's what, you know, that's what we've got to be thankful for turning off selective availability 10 years ago. So it's a pretty big milestone, I think, because GPS systems are one of the greatest inventions of the 20th century. Bet your bottom dollar it is. It's, it's just fantastic. And now we're in the 21st century. It's, you know, this is one of our most valuable tools. So there's probably some of you young whippersnapper viewers out there who probably don't really remember a world without, a, you know, a 5, 10 meter accurate GPS. Well, there was. In fact, there was a world without GPS and internet and video and computer games and everything else. But let's in the internet and let's, but let's not go into that. Okay. There was a time when you know, we just, you know, we didn't take for granted that we could have a GPS in our car or in our mobile phone and it could tell us where we are and all these maps and everything. And when, back in 2000, when, uh, you know, the thing was switched off, you couldn't buy a receiver with maps in it. That was, that was unheard of. But the technology just, bam, it just um, grew exponentially to what we have today, which is GPS and maps in pretty much everything. The other thing about the GPS system is it's so remarkable. With this ancient uh, 10, 12 year old receiver, right, I can get down to, I can find a geocache to with better than five meters. And well, it, that shouldn't be the case because it's got a crap little patch antenna in it. It hasn't got a high sensitivity receiver. But even back in the day when we had these little yellow e-trexes, pretty crap technology, but still, we could get within five meters easily, which was much better than uh, the claimed, you know, 15, 20 meters, you know, radius accuracy, which was which was claimed for, you know, uh, for the non for the non-selective availability GPS. And how that's possible is there's a few techniques you can do for averaging. So if you just switch this on and it gives you a first location, yeah, you're going to be only be about 20 meters, you know, accurate, 15 meters or something like that. But if you let it settle and you walk around and you can do some averaging techniques, you can easily get within five meters. And when you think about it, it's absolutely remarkable how that somebody can, at some you know distant time and date, can have one of these crap receivers, go out and place the cache, uh, so they've got their inherent ac in inaccuracy when they place it. And then you come along sometime later, 
different con atmospheric conditions, different GPS receiver, different everything, you come along and you can get within, you know, five metres. A couple of metres was, you know, was not uncommon. And it was just remarkable, really. Marvellous technology. And of course, that brings me to geocaching. Not geocaching, as you yanks stay. That's wrong. It's geocaching, I guarantee it. That's the correct terminology. Anyway, let's not get into that argument. Geocaching, the ultimate high-tech treasure hunt for nerds. It really is. Where else can you use, you know, billions of dollars worth of military hardware to find a bit of Tupperware in the bush? It's fantastic. If you haven't tried GP, uh, uh, geocaching, give it a go. I highly recommend it. It's a great way to see the outdoors and have a good adventure at the same time. Geocaching started back on May 3rd, uh, 2000, when uh, Dave Ulmer uh, from Portland, Oregon, he um, you know heard about turning selective availability off. It was a big deal in the Psi Geo Satellite News Usenet News Group or something like that. It was a big deal, so he decided that I'll place a you know a big container, I'll bury it in the ground, and I'll put some stuff in it, and I'll publish the location, the coordinates with this new accurate, you know, 5, 10 meter accurate GPS, and he placed the coordinates, and people would go out and find it. It was a GPS stash hunt, as it was called back then. The term geocaching was coined sometime later, but um, yeah, this GPS stash hunt, and in that first post to that Usenet group, he set out all the ground rules for um, the basic uh, fundamentals of geocaching as we still know it today. You know, have a container that contains some, you know, that contains some trinkets or something like that. Put in a logbook so you can sign your name. And and uh, and the rule was, when you find a cache, if you take something, then you leave something as well in the cache for other people to find. And that's that's the rules are, haven't changed to this day. Geocaching, ten years later, there's I don't know, I haven't looked at the stats, but there's got to be millions of geocaches around the world. It's just exploded in popularity and the ground rules pretty much haven't changed at all it's fantastic so good on Dave Ulmer now while I'd heard of geocation I didn't really get into it until about 2001 so I was a bit of a latecomer but um, but today 10 years later I'm considered one of the old timers and one of the original players here in Sydney and um, uh, myself and my wife we're we're called eco team that's our geocaching name and and we've found about we've only found like 233 I think is our cache count and that's and today 200 having found 233 uh, geocaches is is nothing people do that in a day there I think the current record is like 500 in one 24-hour period it's madness I won't go into how you can actually do that I think in Australia it's 200 in a day um, but it's just, it's absolute madness. But uh, back when I was a boy, geocaching, in fact, this is still the best, you know, uh, GPS receiver I've got. There's no maps in here. We didn't have maps. Nowadays, it's got all oh, full color like Google Maps all built into your phone and everything, and all the cache notes are in there. But no, we had to print them out by hand, enter them into the GPS by hand, and um, and manually plot them on, a, on, on the street directory map to see where we were, we were going. And, well, it was much harder back then. So, um, you know, you found one or maybe two caches in a day. But, you know, it's common for people to go out and find 50 or 100 now. It's nothing. Um, so, yeah, I'm not sure who's found the most caches, but I'm sure it's a lot. Like, you know, 10, 20,000 or something like that. It's crazy. So if you're not a geocacher, you're what's called a muggle. And we don't like you. So get out there and try geocaching. Trust me, it's a beauty.